Hello everyone, today we talk about Seleucid, Medium and Light Cavalry, making a little bit of distinction here because essentially we have made our other videos about uh, Seleucid Cavalry, specifically about cataphracts, we have looked at also certain forms of recruitment in other Seleucid videos, we talk about Battle of Azotus in which we saw an employment of Seleucid cavalry and by talking about medium light cavalry is a bit of an approximation that today we make for talking actually of a bit heavier type of cavalry than just medium light one um, that we have to make because uh, today we could even simply talk about the, the lightest forms of Seleucid cavalry that uh, at that point are basically indistinguishable from the ones of any other population out there, right? Thinking about uh, ancient armies and ancient warfare, you, you realize that uh, aside from the, the core troops, you know, the, the hard, uh, heavy ones, uh, this, you know, the strong uh, body of, of uh, armored troops that made up either heavy cavalry, heavy infantry, around which the, the real strength of the army gravitated around was still, and obviously as in any other army in history, lighter troops, right? There were deputed to carry out basically some of the most important uh, military operations out there from scouting, exploring, uh, even pillaging, raiding, um, pursuing the enemy, etc. And this was ultra heavy cavalry, like literally, you know, a person without any armor and a hip just with javelins and light shields, sometimes not even that. Um, and, uh, or knives and stuff like that, right? And, um, and Talking about those um, is um, somewhat, I mean, it's still important because um, you can find plenty of information um, about this lighter troops. I made a video, for example, about the um, Psyloi uh, back in the day. You can find it in the Hellenistic Warfare playlist that fundamentally talks about them and sees in the, uh, yeah, I think it was Hellenistic or maybe even classical warfare at the same time. I don't remember actually. Um, the, the, all the various times these were employment and it turns out that these troops were fundamental importance but that they, they they're somewhat overlooked because in fact uh, we know less about them in part because there is less to know because this was cheap mm, militia that you could recruit basically from everywhere that in this sense didn't have quite much of a uh, tactical differentiation because the 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 task was exactly the same uh, throughout all over the world and they, they did essentially the same things. They were not particularly skilled troops, they weren't professionals, were but they could rise even through experience of course to a certain level of of uh capability that was was very important for any army out there. And and since our attention is polarized by big battles and how the, the tougher troops um were employed, etc because they, they were effectively the shock um, element of the army, or at least the one that could resist uh, uh, more. This, this is normally the, the distinction between uh, cavalry and, and infantry respectively in their roles. But um, <coughs> we, we hear less of the lighter troops that, however, were you know important, especially in the opening phases, uh, open, opening and closing phases of the battle as skirmishers and, and, and uh, run pursuiters, we can say. Um, <coughs> so the problem when I came to talk today about light uh, cavalry in the Seleucid army is that we we don't know much about that. I mean, we could simply stop with what we have just said, um, addressing you to the uh, to that video about Psyloi and um, and uh, that were, however, mostly was talking mostly about the infantry. Uh, skirmishers. Um, and the problem being that, of course, we, we know barely, barely anything about heavier cavalry in the first place, right? And actually, in the case of the Seleucid army, we we dispose overall, let's say, in absolute terms of some important information. In relative terms, is still poor um, overall for, for understanding certain technicalities and how these troops were organized. And um, there is a very, you know, that in Seleucid history, fundamentally, there is this initial phase after the disgregation of Alexander's empire, which th there is a bit of warfare on a large scale, and uh, we know essentially something about the first 
uh, the, the first uh, Seleucid phase, then basically throughout all the the second, uh, the the third century BC, we know uh, we know nothing up to uh, the time of Antiochus the third, from which we not only know more about Seleucid army, but we also observed that um, exactly in that moment was mm, being changed big uh, a big deal, especially in its in its cavalry. Um, and that therefore it was uh, still, um, you know, it was still first of all very active, very very vivacious, very um, a very effective military system, at least thanks to this reorganization, and that it can be framed into a broader um, idea of revival of Hellenistic warfare between the, in fact, the end of the third and beginning of the second century BC. That, however, is basically stopped by the Roman conquest and uh, therefore but lets us mm, see something more about the system. We were still pretty functional. So when it comes to cavalry uh, organization we will definitely talk more in detail about uh, units such as the the cataphracts but we already done you can go watch that video uh, but also about the Agema or the Nisayan cavalry regiment, the, the companion cavalry regiment uh, and so on, but we will do that in in another on another occasion. Today we would like to focus on this properly medium and, and let's say relatively light cavalry that is actually tends tends to be heavier in this sense, more important. And that's the reason why we know more about it. Um, that is, as we will see now, one the one of the philoi, the one of the politikoi, and the one of the epilectoi. Right, and trying to understand what what it was in a phase, by the way, of Seleucid history that is uh, declining because most of our information relatively to this um, units uh, is uh, from the, uh, the 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 accounts on the famous uh, Daphne parade in 165 BC when the Seleucid army had was uh, yeah, and, and the empire as a whole was uh, already uh, crippled and it was basically uh, losing the, the, the had lost the eastern provinces and was reduced mostly to just to Syria and um, and and uh, Cilicia and it was losing in fact lands to the Parthians and Pergamon as it was uh, crushed by by the Romans at the times of Antiochus the third so the the uh, let's say the attempt to uh, extend further the empire carried out by Antiochus III had um, had failed uh, still uh, and obliging at that point to give up also this broader military uh, reform that had been telling the truth pretty effective right when you look at military history of uh, the, the this the late second cent the late third century BC you realize as we were saying before that the Hellenistic armies were a bit resurgent in, in, in quality and in abilities and they were experimenting different forms that were not necessarily... I mean, the, 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 there was a lot of continuity uh, I into the process. The, the Seleucid army was probably the best one, putting a lot of emphasis on cavalry, the Antigonids in infantry, the Ptolemies were experimenting other forms, and but it's, it's substantially um, you know, the, the defeat at the hands of Rome was, you know, some, someone likes to see this, uh, Rome had to conquer everyone and everything, like just in terms, especially of of, of resources. Yes, it, it is true, but it is also true that certain setbacks in this uh, sequence of events from the Ma Macedonian wars or the Syrian one um, could have easily halted even for, for for a few decades but still making it a hell bit a hell of a difference in in the history of that point the same Roman expansion but especially there is this um, even let's say more uh, deterministic approach for by saying by stating that fundamentally the, the Hellenistic tactical systems were all uh, doomed from the of the Roman ones and this is even worse in terms of historical accuracy because if you actually study that military history, you realize that that uh, evidence is not. This is typical of people who I think never actually studied those battles. Just look from the, the outcome what um, you know what it had to be. But uh, Rome won. Let's say it was almost a draw fundamentally if you count the battles and how they happened in terms of 
manipular legion versus a Macedonian phalanx. And there are many factors that have to be taken into consideration. I personally still haven't had the, let's say, the time to to start because I even wrote a little essay um, wh when I was at university back in the day exactly about this. So basically, I studied all those battles and and I noticed that because I I frankly uh, like the Romans more, <laughs> but don't blame me for this. But but I'm actually a huge admirer of Hellenistic warfare, and I uh, some I I, I feel uh, to that I even was even ab adopted by, <laughs> by the Diadochs, meaning that um, they uh, they evidently displayed certain um, capabilities that are deeply overlooked and, and and even more misunderstood, I would say. And uh, this is not fair. T today we will not address these topics, but we will focus. However, this digression was just to give a broader idea on the fact that these military organizations were very complex. Uh, we know relatively few about them, and um, we shouldn't dismiss them just because you know eventually um, th th these um, you know in, in a battle these these armies were were defeated. You know, especially th the largest battles at this point in history are, are really big, decisive events. Like because they uh, they're this great empires managed to concentrate a lot of forces in one place and and, and, and that's the, the, the thing that decides a lot not just tactically speaking but also strategically and uh, let's say that there are relatively few battles uh, that also that we know of because technically uh, th there was much more than, than we know about that warfare that unfortunately has gone lost and naturally, we also have to be careful about the same nature of sources because we we don't know what their sources were in turn. Uh, we realize that, that there are many tendencies and prejudices by saying attributing, for example, certain uh, reliability to, to some authors, pretending that like there were sort of military experts where we actually have no evidence of that, and that also by reading their accounts, we 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 spot even without reading. Uh, even with reading it just in translation, but in, in actually in the real, as we should always do, reading primary sources uh, in the original language is, you know, an obliged point of passage if you're dealing seriously, historically speaking. But you, you can understand from the general way certain topics are addressed that um, we are not told really how how it was. Right? That there is this barrier that we we encounter. And that we can't get through, but through certain, you know, experience. Uh, I would say m the famous military logic that I invoke every once in a while. But in general, also by comparison with all its limits. But we can trace a bit more of a realistic or at least plausible and more logical picture than uh, than is often told in very simplistic terms. So today we talk about this Seleucid cavalry that we could define um, like the uh, properly Seleucid regular cavalry, aside from the, the elite proper, or at least also in here we will see that we're talking about elites in some cases, but um, still not the, the ultra-elite, right? And th there is this great problem in Hellenistic warfare that, especially in this more eastern um, powers that fundamentally we we don't know exactly um, about the, the exact forms of recruitments. I made a video that it was about Syrians, Mesopotamians, and Persians in the Seleucid army that addresses that, tries to explain how certain communities, even from an ethnical point of view, were defined just like a um, you know li like a group of of people who could join this group, so even from different backgrounds, and be part of this. Like, um, you know that in the Seleucid warfare, in, excuse me, in uh, Hellenistic warfare, there are terms like, I don't know, Macedonian, or Tarantine, or let's say other, like the Nisean, in this case, of the Nisean regiment, etc., that are names, essentially, of ethnicities, right? But that, at that point, had to do not where these people actually came from, especially by the 2nd century BC, where this this these empires had now blended with local population, but rather with a uh, form of combat style, right? 
And the Seleucid Empire had objectively the most powerful military among the uh, Hellenistic empires. And um, it, it did so by achieving, in my opinion, a, a, a great match in terms of integration, especially with the Syrian, uh, the Mesopotamian, and partly also the Persian element. So that by looking at this regular cavalry by now, we don't have to think of kind of foreign ethnic troops, but of troops that had, of course, largely remained uh, fundamentally autonomous from a cultural point of view, but were now joining as part of the empire as regulars, right? Because most of the times, especially in the Seleucid sources, I mean, in the sources relative to the Seleucid army, um, there is this tendency, especially after uh, the enduring, uh, of course, the um, reign of Antioch the, the Third, to distinguish brutally between the uh, let's say the the armored cavalry and the mercenaries, and 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 that's cool, right? Because it's some of the most attractive elements of of Seleucid uh, warfare. From one side, these cataphracts that were almost, you know, certainly basically copied up, uh, you know, or however uh, developed after the uh, the Antiochus Anabasis into into Persian territory and emulating fundamentally the cataphracts of, of the Partans, etc. Um, that um, in their armored character were extended to most of Seleucid regular cavalry, right? And we have seen in video on the cataphracts how obviously there was a segmentation that the term cataphract doesn't mean literally fully cataphract, it is fully armored. It, it could, certain cataphracts could, could be even half armored and so on. Um, so th there is this tendency of thinking that like everything was in, in Seleucid cavalry was either all, all armored in some way or uh, mercenary that is foreign. Mm -hmm. So tr ethnic contingents coming from the outskirts of the empire or even beyond like allies etc that were instead foreign troops and they fighting in their own um, ethnical style. But Objectively, um, you know, it, it is true that the Seleucid Empire was very wealthy. It could afford, at one point, this very intense reforming cavalry that could uh, have in a wagon in it and increase in it in, in degree of armor, uh, etc. But there, there was largely, and also especially, we can think after the uh, the the contraction of the empire in the following century, uh, a whole load of um, lighter cavalry that was recruited from the local uh, uh, levies. Um, a, you know, a traditional form of recruitment, but it now made up a true kind of regular force, meaning that um, it wasn't just the, the picked elite, uh, but it wasn't the, the mercenaries either. It was fundamentally the troops of local, especially from, from Syria, uh, from either the Hellenic or Semitic communities of the region or even uh, other lands. So, um, I would say that um, we, we can start with, uh, first of all, with the Philoi regiment. So, the regiment of friends, Philoi, from Philia, which means friendship, love, etc. Um, so, basically, Polybius, uh, 30, 25, 8, mentions uh, during the Daphne Parade of 165 BC, uh, a syntagma of the philoi uh, that followed the the companions that instead were the the, the brothers you know the the Etairoi of the of the Seleucid forces we will see on another occasion. So um, that were, by the way, of the, the similar number of the uh, of the companions that I think it was like one thousand. I don't know. I don't remember. Excuse me. Uh, here, cavalry companions were. Uh, maybe 2,000 if I'm not wrong, um, and um, th they were somewhat similar. So um, this is interesting because this term philoi uh, does not appear uh, as a regiment of the Seleucid army in any other literary passage. This is one of those um, problems we have, that sometimes certain units are mentioned just once, and with these terms that objectively do not define any scientific category for which uh, this could even 
sw be switched, right? So never think that you can't take certain words uh, literally, uh, literally, even if they you know what their etymology is, and and thinking to apply it as a fixed category, because most of the times at this point this is not um, the case. Levy um, doesn't uh, that talks about the um, the Battle of Magnesia mentions uh, in thirty seven forty four six that after the battle that as you know was was a Seleucid disaster. Um, Antiochus the third the commander found out that um, his uh, son Seleucus was still alive. Uh, fortunately, after the disaster, then had fled to Apameia. Apameia, you, you know, there were several cities called Apameia. This is one that stayed in uh, I don't remember which region, but basically in, in Anatolia, um, close to, to to relatively close to Magnesia. Um, and with with some of the friends, right? So um, this passage has been interpreted in a way for which basically select was f seen as accompanied by some of his, uh, of course, of his stuff. As as a prince, he would have his own, uh, you know, entourage and attendants and all. That would have been considered as also the Basileus' friends, so the the, the emperor's uh, friend of uh, uh, friends of Antiochus, uh, as well. So according to this passage, mm, some others said maybe th there was a, actually an entire regiment of these philoi of these friends that existed in on that date, 190 BC. And who knows? Um, um, other people think that um, uh, that uh, in fact you can't trace this direct uh, link between Magnesia and the Daphne parade at a um, at a few years of a uh, few decades of distance um, and uh, actually the syntagma is numbered at a thousand right so uh, this is uh, interesting because most of of uh, Celsius regular before I said two thousand, but it is actually one thousand. Most of the regular cavalry uh, in the Celsius army did count one thousand, right? This uh, kind of standard number, uh, like a of a regular cavalry a regiment, like like the others. Um, however, it, I think it's more realistic, and um, other scholars substantially agree. I think this is the general. Uh, the general take on, on matters that um, they th this philoi were fundamentally not framed into a, a permanent unit into a regular unit, but they were a sort of entourage of the uh, of the king, um, and that uh, in the case especially of Daphne, these uh, may have been just uh, guests fundamentally, you know, Im important um, friends of the. Of the Seleucid that had gathered to to be part of the parade in this um, in this unit that might have been even disbanded just after the parade. Uh, so this is interesting, and this is a term that can be used um, very very easily. Meaning, you know, uh, if you look at these Hellenistic empires, it's obvious that at any time they would have lots of um, of chieftains of of smaller kings or of, of uh, Oligar, important aristocrats, etc., would join from this enormous um, area of, of the empire, or th its surroundings that had something in common with, the, you know, they were allies with the Seleucids. Uh, they, they supported them for, for their own interests, uh, simply because they didn't have much a choice at that point. And that, of course, would be. Um, uh, would be important uh, not just from a military point of view, but obviously also from a political one. And therefore, it's possibly that at any time it was a, f uh, a philos, right? And philoi, uh, the plural, all around the uh, I don't know the the Basileus bodyguard or whatever. So uh, talking about um, that's it. We know nothing about their equipment. We will talk about the equipment later. For now, let's just take a look at these groups, then at their organization and then eventually at the, the equipment. Then there is, interestingly enough, um, another um, uh, cavalry regiment, this time probably really a cavalry regiment, 
uh, or maybe not. Actually, it's a sum, as we will see now, of uh, other elements that, however, were put together for th this occasion that were the one of the politikoi, right? So, Polybius mentions um, these two other cavalry regiments participating to the parade in 165 uh, BC um, that are also not mentioned, by the way, by uh, on Livy's account on, on Magnesi. So Polybius 30, 25, 6 tells that there were 3,000 Ipes Politicoi, which in Greek means citizen cavalrymen, that took part uh, at the parade. And what distinguished them seemingly, we know in this sense something about their appearance, uh, were crowns and phalera, so these um, basically discs that decorated the horse's uh, trappings. Mm -hmm. The phalera is also the one you see, the, you know, those the discs with faces on the centurion's uh, armor, you know, there the, the were uh, forms of, of recognition and also certain, um, you know, s signs of distinction, even, I don't know, medals proper in, in, in some occasion. And and it says, and Polybius says that these politicoi, so uh, this um, citizen cavalry was distinguished in, in those who had golden phalera and silver phalera. Right. So, um, who was the citizen cavalry? Um, so, some have, have s suggested that these were recruited among the ranks of the wealthiest Macedonians. Um, so, those um, communities that were recognized in the political and military organization of the empire as the, the descendants of the of, of the ancient um, Macedonian settlers that made the uh, in this case for example the same uh, companion regiment right so they made also the, the fa made up the phalanx etc but at this point there would be a, a you know discrepancy because you know if these would have been the same people why why calling them ipa Politico e, like if, if you have the, uh, the the Macedonians, you know, that are record would be recorded in the same way. W what's the the sense of distinguish? Shame. So, better um, a more probable explanation because we, we don't basically we basically don't know the answer. Like these are universally unknown topics, like we, that we can't make only guess about. So, the sense in here is that uh, this Politico e regiment was recruited among the wealthiest citizens of the cities, so the polis, hence politicoi, so the, literally the, the citizens, um, of what remained of the empire, so not tied to the ancient you know, uh, legal status of the Macedonians of the ancient settlement system, but simply on the base of the city aristocracies. Um, and uh, this is interesting because in the Hellenistic tradition, the cities um, since Alexander's time were fundamentally not um, really conquered uh, from from an institutional point of view. I mean, obviously the empire ruled over them, but they were still left uh, as mm, sumakoi, right? So as allies, as as friends. Uh, this is something that also the Romans did, for example, when they went in the in the east because they wanted to to walk in the footsteps of Alexander. This was this idea of greatness of the universal empire for which you didn't even need to conquer one place, but just to to be so powerful by yourself to say that these were friends and you had uh, you were protecting them and hiding you know the hypocrisy that obviously you were ruling over them and you were imposing them this um the, in this case, this military contributions, um, and, and and naturally you have to think of the systems as, as large clientels. Of course, the, the aristocrats were kind of happy to be part of such a larger empire, sharing the benefits and and mm, positions of power, and so on. So there were um, ties also with the same monarch, right? And, and they were important by themselves for the same Seleucid army because. Um, you know, the cities, especially of Syria, Mesopotamia, so the core of the Seleucid Empire, were, you know, massively urbanized areas since millennia, as you know. So 
the, the very important cities uh, that supplied kind of wealthy aristocracy with good equipment and that had also this um, emphasis on cavalry that this is kind of forgotten that especially certain areas of Babylonia and what media especially had been for b even though if, if with a bit of a different um, with a di different tradition uh, they have substantial cavalry not only that um, and all thanks to, to essentially the wealth uh, of their of their cities um, and um, for example, uh, there was a great, seemingly a strong relation with the city of Larissa in, in Syria. Mm. Um, in, in, in the and, uh, and, and many of these cities were also, in, in the case of Larissa, for example, these were, had been ancient colon Greek colonies fundamentally, had been founded by the Macedonians when they, they had arrived in, in the west, uh, excuse me, in the east, um, and they, um, you know, th were this an you know mm, Hellenic elements had settled, although uh, let's say obviously mixing with the local population, but maintaining, however, this idea that, that the city was ethnically Greek. Also, because the the political system was a bit different from 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 the others. Um, and the um, so th there is even to to suggest that these were coming from 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 this set of cities of, of the empire not just just Antioch for example the capital of the empire at this point or, or Larissa that we've just named but basically all, all, all the cities of the empire in general and this makes the uh, us reflecting on the better on the organization of this unit that at this point given this premises would have not been um a kind of a of a of a unique entity like it would be essentially a sum all of all of these smaller units that would come obviously in relatively smaller small groups from all of the cities right and the fact that Polybius states the difference between the golden and the silver phalera might um kind of uh su support this this hypothesis in the sense that um, this differentiation is a sort of uh, probably social status differentiation. We don't know whether it was on, on the base of the same cities, their importance, whether it was based on some other social differentiations, but therefore this th it seems that we're not really dealing with a unitary cavalry regiment, but with like a sum of uh, small squadrons supplied by a certain amount of cities, right? And always remember in this sense that, yeah, it's not that literally all the cities of the empire participated. We, we don't know how the relations were regulated. Maybe certain cities didn't even have to supply troops for 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 the the, the Basileus, uh because they had other conventions um, and others simply maybe wouldn't send them because, you know, political problems are always there uh, at all times. So this is the the take we have on this 3,000, 3,000 Ipeis politicoi, which 3,000 is not a few because it's substantially more than the, let's say, average 1,000 cavalry regiment that we find in a regular, uh, among the Seleucid regulars, right? The other unit is the one of the Epilectoi. Uh, Epilectos in Greek meaning the, the, the chosen one, the, the, the one chosen a bow. Um, also the term where epileptic comes from in medicine because uh, in ancient times epileptic people were believed to have been chosen by the gods that because they entered in this state of uh, unconsciousness was believed like being having a kind of ultra uh, like a contact with the div divinity right so um, and Polybius 30 25 8 introduces us to to the epilecto stating uh, so always in the same Daphne parade, saying that they followed the Philoi. Right. So this was the thousand picked cavalry, uh, chosen cavalry of the Epilecti. Um Once again, this name, just like for the Philoi, just uh, for the Ipeis Politicoi, is not mentioned in any other literary record. So we, um, 
we we have a very few evidence uh, el uh, in general uh, yet we, we can maybe try to identify where it came from so this I mean when you find uh, epilectoi in um, in in any kind of context and uh, you know ancient warfare but not only right in Greek it's obvious that you know if you're talking about a picked chosen troops well these are gonna be rarely just throw away troops like this this is partly elite and therefore this was more of a heavy cavalry regiment than, than anything right and um, we um, we know um, that the citizens of Larissa in Syria that we mentioned before that was a colony of the same Larissa in Thessaly that was famed Thessaly was famed, very famed for, for cavalry, um, supplied cavalry to the king in, according, in accordance to the uh, Simmachia uh, relation, uh, uh, agreement, right? So Larissa was one of those cities that, that provided horses to the, to, to, to the Seleucid arm. Um, and um, this was, we know this actually from the times of Seleucus I, so very, very early in time. Um, and this was done in a way that was very resemblant, in fact, of the traditional Macedonian uh, feudalism, like the, that was replicated also in the uh, forms of settlements, in this case in Apoikia, um, as a military colony, um, with land which they were settled for which they had to provide certain military service and um, this mm, types of, of troops are to be found um, since I mean the, the ancient Macedonian army since since uh, I mean the, ar the, ar the army of Alexander that, uh, at that point um, yeah, although seemingly as mercenary troops which eventually passed into Seleucid service upon the disintegration of the empire. Um, this is interesting because you know that the Macedons also used Thessalian cavalry that wasn't quite uh, Ma Macedonian, was Thessalian in fact. So there is this relation of wh where did really these troops come from and that how they were originally. Well, they, jo they had joined. Macedonian army during the invasion of the Persian Empire and they had remained there and eventually were settled. It's very normal. Um, Theodorus um, states that the Arisians had fought in the first Agema of the cavalry force. And uh, this is interesting because in the Seleucid army the Agema was usually um, it's the name used to define the elite Median cavalry regiment. Um, so the point has been um, analyzed and by certain authors like Barkochva, for example, that wanted to explain this uh, this connection uh, that. The, the the reference of uh, of Theodorus is the Larissians in the first Agema is from 142 BC, so later on had supported Theodorus. Mm -hmm. So, um, what is interesting it, is that at this point in the mid, um, uh, actually in the second half now, the second century BC, the Seleucids had lost Media to the Parthians. Right, so basically had lost the sources of support at there of the Median uh, Agema that had been one of the, the most famous and uh, heaviest um, regiments of, of Seleucid cavalry. So um, I don't think there is any evidence of the disbandment of that unit, the explicit one, but I it's, mm, you know, we, we can hypothesize that the Median Agema, meant especially as recruited from Media proper, at this point didn't exist anymore. Media was important, there, there, was, there were the stables of Apameia that were the most important 
um, cavalry barracks um, for of, of the empire. So it was a you know even infrastructurally speaking, it was a big loss. Um, so it's been suggested that um, the, um, the the Larissian uh, the, the uh, Larissian regiment was renamed as Agema by um, I mean later in later times actually from by by this the by Alexander Palace I think there is some evidence of this I don't know where it's stated if it's the same Theodorus I don't remember actually but um, there's evidence to consider that um, the the Agama was transferred into these troops that for this reason might have been uh, maybe not acquired the same title of Agema but of something similar and therefore epilectoi could could work always bear bearing in mind what epilectoi means what agema uh, means which is basically the 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 commanding units or something like that if, if i'm not uh, wrong so this this idea that it was a uh, a chosen body right you know the, the agema was also the uh, was considered best cavalry regiment in the Seleucid army back in the day, so it had the precedence of the right wing, etc. So um, the term epilectoi is fitting, and it so this is still an hypothesis, but it's been suggested it was transferred, in fact, to to these um, troops at at Lars, right? Because there is the this coincidence with the term agema at one point in the sources, right? So it, it's possible, it's possible that... Um, so we don't know anything in, in to, to sum up about the official name, uh, but we, 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 we may suggest that it's, it was this overlapping of the Agema and Epilectoi force for, for considering the depicted nature of, of these troops. And there is a fragment, um, also from the third book of the histories of Poseidonius, that deals with the civil strife between the citizens of Larsa and the one of Apameia, that took place uh, in the civil war between Tryphon and Demetrius, the second in the late uh, 40s of the uh, second century BC. And this uh, source tells us that the combatants used small daggers worn at the waist and small spears covered in rust and dirt and wide-brimmed hats which uh, shaded their eyes. Mm -hmm. uh, but did not constrict the throat. Um, and this has been interpreted uh, as follows, because basically there is a famous wide-brimmed Thessalian hat that, in this sense, may uh, re-recall, uh, uh, may be reconnected to to Larissa in Syria, like this uh, Thessalian colony that might have maintained this kind of headgear at one point. And uh, um, in any case. You know, the rest of the equipment doesn't really seem to be the one of a pretty heavy uh, cavalry. Um, and generally speaking, this source is also a bit considered to have been a bit, a bit unreliable. Um, it was kind of caricaturing the Lar Lar Larissaian cavalry at this point. So, but this is just another hint that we have. And, and definitely, when we talk about these regiments, and especially thinking that they might have come at one point from one specific city and one kind of center that had evidently uh, it was a community on its own, we can legitimately think that more than, at least in this case, where the uh, the the origin of these troops was relatively. Uh, recent, meaning that it wasn't an ethical way of fighting, it's basically the name of that specific city there, that this Larissians could field different types of troops, so like an, an entire army on their own, in terms of tactical 
differentiations, right? So, whichever the evidence is that in this case is pretty, pretty poor and unreliable, but we can also think that, yeah, okay, this city might have specialized by some tradition brought from Thessaly or whatever, this heavy cavalry uh, or simply cavalry tradition, but, you know, not all, but it might have, they surely fielded some, some infantry. Right? So, talking about the, the organization of Seleucid cavalry, uh, a bit more in depth that we can extend to this kind of medium um, and even lighter troops, we have a very few to base ourselves upon. Uh, there is the source of the first century BC that is Asclepiodotus, that is famous for his uh, military writings, and um, the um, that can be also compared uh, compared with uh, Elian, chapter twenty. That uh, gives us this um, typical um, uh, Greek. Uh, organization based on scales of two, right? Talking about cavalry specifically, he starts from this smaller for the, the unit of the uh, called ile. That would be a squadron essentially with a strength of 64. Then it rose to the epilarchia 128. The tar uh, tarantinarchia 256, the Iparchia, 512, the Ephiparchia at 1024, and the Telos at 2048. This is Asclepiodosus uh, 711. So that's basically uh, what we know about the, the general uh, Hellenistic cavalry organization. Um, can this apply to the Seleucid army? Well, uh, there is a study by Van Thudak uh, who um, used Asclepiodotus military informations to um, uh, the mm, and um, evidence uh, uh, in in the Ptolemaic um, regarding Ptolemaic armies in attested in the papyri to see that in the case of the Pl Ptolemaic armies, in fact, this Asclepiodotus system corresponded, right, organically speaking. Um, and talking about cavalry specifically, in fact, uh, there was kind of a positive achievement in this regard because um, it turns out that the Eparchy was effectively a basic Ptolemaic cavalry unit. There was even evidence for the Elarchs and Epilarchs as and there are four commanders, respectively, of the Ile and the uh, Epilarchia. Um, and uh, perhaps also about the Epiparchus, so commanders of the Ep Epiparchia. Um, there, nobody actually knows um, if Asclepiodotus was writing, thinking about the Ptolemaic army organization, because uh, Asclepiodotus writes, you know, in general, like talks, you know, from this Helena, uh, Hellenistic, one, uh, you know, first century BC about those armies and uh, without specifying. And but seemingly there is no specific connection, and it seems at that point to be uh, to have been told that he had been talking about this late Hellenistic organization as a whole. Um, and obviously um, these organizational structures all come in the case of for what we can see also in the ar in the infantry not just in cavalry in the Seleucid and Ptolemaic armies from from the army of Alexander. right? So it's obvious that th these armies may have certain features in common relatively to their organization. Um, we do know, for example, that the Eparchia and the Ile were uh, units in the Macedonian cavalry under the same Alexander. Um, so, considering these factors, let's consider what we can draw from the Seleucid organization. But 
Seleucid cavalry organization, about which we know, however, very few. So as we've seen, there's this exception presented by the Ipais Politikoi that um, counted overall 3,000 men in, in a single regiment, and we have explained that it might have been some simply because it was a sum of different squadrons coming, uh, coming a bit from everywhere uh, in the empire and put together not like a regular unit but just you know in the case of Daf uh, in the occasion of Daphne's parade then there are the cataphracts that we haven't seen today but basically they counted the same uh, parade at 1500 while all the other cavalry regiments participating to Daphne's parade numbered 1000 Right, so there is this rough standard. So, first of all, this should already trigger you some sort of reflection that probably these cavalry regiments were div subdivided in like two battalions by 500 each. Let's see if this is this is functional to what it fits with wh what we know. Um, so, as we have said before, Asclepiodotus talks about uh, the uh, for a uh, unit of 1,024 men, so approximate to the 1,000, uh, known as the Elfi Parkie. Uh, Polybius, as we've seen, defines this regiment as, uh, as um, syntagma, uh, as uh, he uses this term to, to define the philoi that were 1,000, as we've seen. Uh, so the name of what would be the standard regiment. So this already shows you how the, the term can 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 uh, can apply different terms because obviously compared to epiparchia is a kind of a more specific term. Syntagma simply means formation, right? So yeah, okay, it's a formation, but which formation it is? Is it a battalion? Is it a regiment? Or whatever. So. Considering the number of cataphracts, as we've seen of 1,500, we can see that the subunits of these regiments could be um, a half regiment, or better, a battalion of 500 men. So do we have evidence of 500 men units from elsewhere in the Seleucid army? Um, yes, because we have a certain Bu Plagos that is mentioned fighting uh, at the Battle of the Thermopylae in 191 BC in the army of Antiochus the, the Great against the Romans was called as a certain Hipparchus from Syria mm. um, so he was an Hipparch um, and therefore commander as we have seen before uh, wi wi in Asclepiodotus to an eparchia that counts 512 men. So yay, we are here. Th this is a battalion of 500 men. It can fit. So it seems that the Seleucids did have, aside from these regiments that are vaguely known as syntagma, it might have been also called epiparchia to following Asclepiodotus at this point, that um, were subdivided in 500 men uh, uh, commanded by Hipparch. So having an eparchia by, by themselves. Um, the term, the name um, Buplagos or Ox Mater, um, is a kind of a strange name, though. So that you have to imagine this army is being kind of multi-ethnical on their own, as we've seen. Um, and surprise, surprise, turns out that this name, uh, this Greek personal name, is typical and restricted, especially from in the sources, to Thessaly. Ha uh ha! -huh. So, it this may be actually a, another suggestion that this Buplagos might have been from this Syrian city of Larissa, ancient Thessalian colony, that served in, in a cavalry regiment raised from there. That was subdivided, in fact, in uh, uh, in uh, Hipparchia, right? So, this might be good evidence, actually. Uh, even if it's just a, a hypothesis for for the, the existence of these two types of units, at least, into the Seleucid army. Uh, Asclepiodotus 
talks about a small, the smaller units of, would be a half of an hyparchia that is known as the Tarantine Archaea. So the Tarantines, as you know, uh, if you don't, we have never talked about it, but basically there were certain Hellenistic mercenaries that uh, originally came from the city of um, Tarentum in in southern Italy. Uh, they were a Spartan colony. And uh, the Tarentine style fighting on horseback was the first one that brought a shield used uh, in Greek cavalries for the first time um, uh, amongst, uh, you know, skirmishing cavalry, actually. So Greek skirmishers up to Tar uh, the Tarentines introduced this other fashion had not fought with shields. Tarentines did. And the term Tarentine, especially in the full um, Hellenistic age, Tarentine cavalry eventually disappears for a certain point towards the 3rd, 2nd century BC. Um, as not much of a type of fighting, but uh, as a name, right? Um, so Tarentine didn't actually mean that everybody who was a Tarentine came from, from Tarentum, but simply that they were fighting in the style that had been uh, started, let's say, by the Tarentines. And and the fact that Asclepiodotus inserts this term I into, uh, like, uh, makes one unit within the, the, the military hierarchy uh, named after Tarentines speaks for the, say at this point, of the complete um, flattening of, of that Tarentine name. That at this point it's not even at this point it's not even a, a tactics or uh, let's say a better combat style. Um, even a name of that sounds like that echoes the Tarentines because maybe at one point in some Hellenistic army, maybe there were units of Tarentines that were inserted in the army that had maybe that kind of size and eventually it remained just uh, a unit named with kind of uh, like Tarentines for the size but not for its actual composition and being part of of, of ranks that is obvious here that has nothing to do with you know uh, if you. If you state that, you have to to think that at least that unit fought, uh, that, that all these units fought in a Tarantine fashion, like skirmishers, but it's evidently not not the case. Even though probably the worst skirmishers and still those cavalry were um, the probably segmented uh, within themselves, like they didn't fight all in the same exact way. But we will see it a bit later. And. Um, and in fact, um, this name of Tarantine Archaea doesn't appear nor in Ptolemaic nor in Seleucid armies ever, like a term. Uh, eventually, um, so this is important because the Eparchy uh, would be made up by these two Tarantine Archaeae, right? And um, it seems to be an Athenian practice rather than. Uh, Diadox ones, and uh, it's interesting because in the second century, after 168 BC, one of the two Athenian eparchs was uh, designated as eparch to Lemnos, that residing on that specific island. So this left in Athens just one eparch, uh, but w with two. Tarantine arcs under his command. Um, so it's been suggested that the eparch that remained in Athens uh, had two Tarantine archaei of of cavalrymen under his command, and uh, the source of Posidonius that he mentioned before. Um, was um, was around um, uh, was in Athens actually at the time in which he was writing, and Asclepiodotus used him as a source. Um, so it, it's possible that Asclepiodotus simply got this thing of the Tarentine Archaea from from this Athenian military practice, as uh, at this point is more as a philological term than you know caring it coming from 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 that source and not 
really meaning to, to apply that for other Hellenistic cavalries, right? We know that at the time of Antiochus III, the Seleucid Eparchia was divided into Semaiae. Yeah, the, the term uh, Semaiae is um, meant to define a, um, a, a, a unit, because that's li literally what it means, that fights under the same uh, banner. Eventually, another term that is used is Ulamoi, for the same unit. Uh, the source of this is Polybius 10.49.7. So, in, in, in the Hellenistic military in general, the term Ulamos is used to define a troop of about 50 men, uh, which therefore uh, was pretty... So, it was a squadron, essentially. So, th it was a pretty dynamic tactical unit pretty independent tactical unit uh, on the battlefield. Um, and the Samaya, or the standard instead, was... Um, ah, excuse me, I said the Samaya and the Ulamoi were actually the same unit. No, the, the Samaya were actually higher uh, uh, unit uh, of the uh, larger, un larger formation than the Ulamos, right? Um, However, it, it doesn't seem, because we know it from other units, but it doesn't seem to be a substantially larger formation either. Like, it doesn't seem that the Semaya and the Olamos were, like, one, like the Semaya, superior to the Olamos, because maybe it contained other Olamos. It seems like to be two similar units in which the Semaya was larger, but the, uh, you know, that didn't have, it was a kind of a parallel unit size of to one of the Ulamos. Um, so this type of units might have continued to be used in, in the second century. We, we don't know. Um, we, we just have one bit of information from the title of Royal Squadron that existed. And um, we, we don't know whether this squadron or Ile, as it was called, existed as a formation, for example, within the Parkia, so as a subunit that was similar to the Semaya in this sense, or, or something else. Um, or whether this term of royal squadron was used, in fact, just for talking about the, uh, the royal squadron uh, proper and survived just as a honorific term to within uh, the regiment of the companions for example as because it was a you know obviously a unit of, of honor in this sense so if all of these units survived into the second century and maybe even existed at the same time um, it, it's been speculated that fundamentally the Eparchia of 112, uh, according to Asclepiodotus subdivision, might have been divided in two Eli of 256. So, um, essentially, what in Asclepiodotus would be the equivalent of a uh, Tarantine Archiae. Eventually, in four Semai of 128, and maybe eight Olamoi of 64, but this is entirely speculative, like we don't know. Uh, we have seen before that we have no proof even without, uh, with uh, um, regard to the Semaya and the Ola, uh, Ulamoi, whether they, they were the Semaya, w the Semaya were um, larger units the, than the Ulamoi, and that kind of a multiples of them, let's say better. So this is basically uh, all we know about the organization of Seleucid cavalry. Uh, uh, in this sense. Talking about the equipment, uh, where here it gets tougher because uh, we, we have to try not to be dogmatic, we have to try to be uh, open to, like, as we said before, with the Larry science, we, they might have been equipped in, in very different ways. Right, as far as we know, 
there might have been easily here heavily equipped cavalry uh, kind of lighter shock cavalry there might be even be horse archers like after after all after the, the fights against the Parthians, you know the, the Celsius surely had horse archers now their their troops I mean there is nothing wrong you you don't have to, to it's not a big deal, especially the frontier troops, but say the horse archery was spread basically everywhere at that point. Uh, we don't have to be dogmatic, saying, ah, the, 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 the Salicids didn't have them, because maybe you haven't seen it in video games. Well, they did have them, right? And and that's because we have the tendency to, to forget, in fact, those kind of auxiliary troops that instead, as we were saying at the beginning of the video, were making up the kind of large numbers of troops, and were particularly uh, important and uh, in any case uh, uh, this is uh, reinforced even by the fact that as we have seen the philoi, the ipes politicoi and the epilectoi were as we've seen like kind of more than sometimes even even than medium cavalry I mean this was kind of heavier cavalry as well so where's the evidence in Seleucid, in the Seleucid armies for for heavier cavalry well, we don't have it because essentially, at the uh, Daphne parade, we have just the the cooler troops, at least mentioned, and who cared about those other lighter troops who were pr presumably also of lower social status? I mean, who gives a damn about them, right? <laughs> um, so, but they existed. Of course, they exist, and you don't need uh, an evidence to to know that they existed because every single army up th at that point had them. And, and probably in the case of the Seleucids, and even though we, we, this is really speculation, however, um, well, it's not entirely speculation, it's meaning that uh, this lighter cavalry had to pave the road for, for the same heavier cavalry in some way. Hell, it's even possible that the Seleucids used horse archer at this point to make this heavier cavalry uh, attacking in, in some fashion, some shock uh, troops fashion. As it's possible that this kind of auxiliary troops were let's say auxiliary, let's say these lighter troops were part of these same units by certain standards, especially if they were operating as uh, kind of, uh, let's say, uh, autonomous tactical units on their own, because these troops, as we've seen, were called to perform their duty in the uh, Imperial Army, but, you know, if uh, the Larissians, for example, wanted to fight alone against local rebels, something like that, you know, they had to to deal that, like, that they wouldn't send just cavalry, they would send other troops. The reason why they are recorded as cavalry at that point is that because they were required by the Emperor to send horses, but this doesn't mean that they did fight just with horses in their in, uh, at home, right? So this is important, and this is important to stay open because literally all, all the world functions in these ways. So even without explicit uh, or direct evidence, we have still. I mean, we kind of know that it was like this. Um, so, um, regarding to equipment, it gets a bit more complicated, meaning that from Alexander onwards, the kind of regular horsemen, as we have defined it before, um, wore kind of relative uh, heavy equipment for the time standards. There was breastplates and a system. Um, to which in the time of the Diadox were added shields as well. Um, there are there is evidence, let's say, um, about, uh, for example, Antiochus' uh, right wing at the battle against Molon, this battle we have to, to see in, in Babylonia, it was a very interesting battle between Antiochus III and this Babylonian uh, was a Seleucid rebel, basically, had taken over Babylonia and other eastern lands, included Xistophore cavalry. This is Polybius 553-2. And Fam Flaminius, also in his address to the Achaeans, des describes the Seleucid cavalry as uh, long Kophoroi and Xistophore, that is, troops that uh, bore the long K and Xiston. The, the difference is the long cap basically is a, is a Greek term 
that defines very broadly some kind of um, heavy javelin. It's the same term that the Greeks used to, to talk about, for example, the liberal Phoenician um, heavy javelins, that the Loeb translator mistakenly took it from, from, a, from a pike like the, the Sarissa, so certain authors like even Connolly, I mean people who you know were very famous, you know, presume that Carthaginians used pikes, which never did like the Macedonians, it would never happen, never happen. They were using these heavier javelins that are used also as stopping lances basically. Um, and the, the, it's the long case also term for defining certain marines, heavy javelins that were used on board of ships, something like that. And, and it did, this tells you how flexible um, these terms could be and not categorical. The existence instead was this um, long, uh, you know, uh, sp uh, spear, right, for cavalry. Um, and this statement comes from Plutarch, the life of Flaminius, 17.5. Um, and it seems that after the Battle of Panion, in 200, I think it was 200 BC, um, so at the time of Antiochus III, Seleucid regular cavalry, so this cavalry recruited properly from the local levies of the empire, not the mercenaries, uh, might have been fully armored. There is enough evidence in this sense in Polybius 16, uh, 17.6 and 30.25.6 and also Levi 30.46 uh, to 11. And this is, as we were saying before, maybe an, uh, an exaggeration that mostly derives, in fact, from what we know about magnesia. I mean, the idea that, uh, and we talk about this in the video we made on Seleucid cataphracts. Um, uh, which is impressive, and we don't have time now to, to stop on it, but probably, you know, there were still lighter troops of some sort. Um, and uh, it's possible that, let's say, the Seleucids wanted to concentrate it in, in moments especially of, of, of substantial floridity of the empire, that they wanted to capitalize on, on their wealth by after the Anabasis that had reconquered several lands and, you know, uh, under Antiochus III the, the empire was revived. That the, uh, uh, even because of this massive military expanses, it was better to field, at least uh, to maybe make the, the, lo the, the levies paying for, for their service, to which this uh, substantial picked body of armored troops could be levied, while the lighter, let's say medium lighter troops could be simply fielded by the mercenaries, the, the, the allied, the subject populations of external to the empire. So it's plausible and this is what brings this approximation that however contains truth that kind of all this regular, Seleucid regu regular cavalry by, have been armored at least in some way by meaning, you know, from heavy to, to medium, right? Um, so, uh, we obviously know that uh, from this time onwards there are also the cataphracts that they, you know, were imitated by the Seleucids after their invasion of Parthia in 210 to 206 BC, uh, about which we also we don't, we don't know much uh, in, in practice, I mean, uh, uh, about this campaign in general. Um, <coughs> and we know that uh, from from the Battle of Magnesia, that uh, since the guard were the uh, that uh, that even the guard contingents of the Seleucid army were turned into sort of cataphracts or something like that. Um, the companions at Magnesia are defined with lighter armor for themselves and their horses in reference of of the cataphracts, right? But otherwise, with equipment not uh, unlike the rest, we'll still refer to the cataphracts, right? So this is probably Levy. May, uh, this is Levy thirty-seven forty, eleven, stating that uh, you know this was ultra heavy cavalry that the Seleucids had in large numbers because he had to make appear like the Romans fighting against this extra powerful army, wh which it was probably, but probably you know thinking that 
they were so have also heavily armored is bit you know which other army out there had this kind of troops in these numbers like not even the most heavily armored real cataphracts of the steppes were a uh, used in large numbers definitely an empire can do like surely the the, the Celsius had were wealthier than the average steppes um, uh, you know uh, polities but uh, still still we don't know f for, for sure right and um, and uh, in terms of other elements of, of the equipment so we have seen this major distinction between Longforoi and Xistoforoi which suggests that part of the cavalry as it would be normal for t times would be skirmishers and shock cavalry respectively and um, yeah kind of makes sense it's a bit like the infantry after all you know that there are the skirmishers and then, then there are the heavier troops obviously infantry and cavalry differ in terms of tactical employments uh, the infantry has mostly a stopping power cavalry has uh, the shock cal uh, shock uh, char uh, let's say attack function and uh, so that's it we uh, can suggest in broader fashions of equipment that there were many external influences of mercenaries also that today we didn't treat but we will do at one point uh, it's possible that there was a as it was normal also in other areas of the Hellenistic world of a sound tra Thracian influence for example with uh, Thracian helmets uh, and uh, kind of also long slit uh, armholes uh, Cuirasses could be on average of linen or even leather cuirasses. Strips could wear clocks. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, clocks. And um, some troops. Um, there, were, there is evidence from terracotta figurines from the early Seleucid capital Seleucia on the Tigris that shows, for example, uh, other uh, small round shields, but also soft caps. Uh, not just helmets so here we have more of a light cavalry because that's the kind of cavalry that doesn't have quite quite of a much heavy equipment now it's kind of a really without proper armor and in some case we can uh, see short sleeves sometimes uh, even trousers uh, that were kind of especially the pointed cap and baggy trousers might be closely related to the part in clothing uh, that as we've seen probably many Seleucids had acquired at this point because uh, you know think about the Anabasis you know go into the Iranian plateau which in, in winter is is it fr freaking cold in many areas so you have to start wearing something like that but even the same Anatolia in, in or Caucasus in in winter not that that uh, but hell not even Syria not even Mesopotamia after all are necessarily that 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 warm weather so at the end of the day so uh, this is typical even with the Romans so people believe that the Romans didn't get trousers before they got to places like Gaul or or somewhere else well try to go to Italy in winter in the Apennines and then we will talk again about that um, it's um, it's simple uh, pragmatism right um, and we can imagine as we were saying at the beginning that um, there w would be many different styles of clothing and uh, coming from the local traditions of Syria and Mesopotamia that were very mixed and, uh, and especially the local militias that were not issued with more than just a you know standard uh, panoply would would wear in whichever way they wanted and of course think about the Hippies political edict we remembered before like if this were all small qu squadrons they probably all had their own uh, colors their own their own banners I mean their own flags their own uh, even mm, type of we weapons like you know that they, they weren't terrifically different but from you know the Empire was was pretty large so yeah they, they could differ the, the I don't know troops from media 
uh, were surely had kind of different outlook than troops from Lebanon, right? And um, what else could we say in terms of uh, of equipment? Uh, we have, by the way, we talked about the Battle of Azotus some some time ago, and um, the we talked about the power of the cities drawn in that battle uh, from the s certain Seleucid cities against the the Maccabees in that case. So we can't think of a functional city militias that that had their own organization. We have seen before the importance of cities like Antioch or Larissa, right? Um, the uh, the uh, we we could talk also about the Antiochian citizens because uh, at one point Demetrius II uh, was uh, upset by them and he disarmed them. So that's uh, because even if they had their form of even effective military organization and the Antiochians were were even uh, joining um, uh, Antiochus the the seventh in his disastrous Parthian war in 129 and they many of them were, were, were lost on that occasion. So these were you know we, we're talking about uh, kind of a late time of the empire that was grown weak had was kind of a rump just with Syria uh, at that point but th this increased over time the importance of the city militias because at that point the, the great system of military recruitment based on military settlement etc was lost because now the empire was reduced to just a small region so uh, you couldn't have that anymore you couldn't even have probably a phalanx anymore because in order to have phalanx you need to have a, a massive amount of land and uh, of population and wealth um, so city militias made up for them uh, in, uh, in part and naturally city militias are not really the best force you can field meaning that there's not big deal of tactical synergy you know city militias are mostly um, that they're usually n non-professionals First of all, and secondly, they, they they're not happy to venture out of their city for much because they're essentially citizens. They have their own business. They don't like to abandon it, um, and also they 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 don't have this broader collective training altogether. So you can't make them perform more than you know certain tactical tasks. Um, so, yeah, um, the. Um, the the terracottas f of warriors from Seleucia and on the Tigris shows troops that are that are mostly Tureoforoi, both infantry and cavalry, that could be city militia as well. So the Tureoforoi were a type of troop uh, that. Also here we should make an entire video to explain what the Tureoforoi were, but essentially uh, this is a, a typical Greek denomination that took the name from the shields. More Romans usually named the, their units after their, their weapons, um, Greeks after their shields. And the Tureoforoi simply mean, means the Tureoi uh, bearers. That so the Tureoi, singular Tureos, is, is a shield that literally means door because it was very large. And it was seemingly of either of Gallic, uh, say of Celtic, better, and of uh, either of Italic um, origins that came into the Balkans either through the the Celtic invasions of the third century BC or the um, the Italic auxiliaries that came back from Pyrrhus' campaign from 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 Italy. And they, um, this type of shield spreads from in Greece and in the whole Hellenistic world at one point, and uh, with the only difference that the Greeks themselves, I mean, the, the, the this Hellenistic powers, uh, seemingly had smaller size in these shields, which came to be employed at uh, basically at every single level. Here we see infantry and cavalry and light cavalry actually using them. And and the Tureoforos uh, at this point starts to become like a sol like a trooper that is 
more kind of light infantry. I mean, some of the best to offer could even be kind of a medium infantry with certain both skirmishing and even melee capabilities. But most of them were kind of light troops, and there were some. I mean, when we talk about the tour offering, we don't have to think we are talking strictly about this Hellenic slash Hellenistic copy, um, because the same Greeks called I, as tour offering every single trooper that had this kind of lighter shield and and javelins and, and maybe a spear. That basically was the the standard warrior of the world world at the time. So uh, places like Asia Minor, uh, the the Caucasus, Persia, you know, were full 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 of these troops from every literally every freaking where. Uh, so and these were ethnic groups that uh, ethnic contingents that or were already used to, to fight in that way, and it also sold their services as, as mercenaries. So. At this point, the tour offers can mean literally everything. It could be a city militia, as we have seen in here. It can be maybe some mercenary garrison. It can be local ethnic troops. It can be literally everything. We'll have to make a troop of, uh, a video on the tour offer because it's, they're very, very interesting and they, they would impress you in, in even in their how ancient in origin they were conceptually speaking. All the problem with the tour else, this oval shield. Um, oh, uh, you know. We will see why th th this troops spread from a certain point onwards. A typical Hellenistic warfare, however, they they kind of represent the transition from Hellenic, from classical to Hellenistic warfare, and um, but they somewhat had uh, been experimented since the time of Pericles in the fifth century. But we will have, as I say, once again, talk about them in an ar on another occasion. Um, so, yeah, th this was mostly it. I think we can concluded here um, what can we can, can we learn from this well you know <laughs> that the studying this things is pretty messed up meaning meaning that we, we know very few uh, the few we know kind of makes sense though so which is kind of comforting because even if the the most um, uh, let's say even if we, we, we tend to remain just in terms of speculation, we, we still can make sense of certain things we see, right? And there are some congruences, as we are trying to express today, there are some uh, aspects of these um, militaries that are have also have something in common, and that, that helps. Um, there is a uh, there was probably much greater flexibility in the military organizations that we can imagine. And that's why I'm dealing with these topics like chunk after chunk, because, um, you know, uh, I care very much about, as, as you know, I'm, I'm a medievalist and I, you know, I should do something else, <laughs> I should be doing something else right now and talking about ancient warfare, but it's always a pleasure for me to talk about it, because uh, there was a time in my life in which I was very very keen on it and I uh, and I sometimes I, I bump into certain videos that are, or other stuff that is written out here on the internet it's that <laughs> like come on you know we have this th you know there is something about ancient warfare that, that everybody can I'd say everybody can understand ancient warfare decently because what we know is so relatively few that you can't I mean literally w once you have learned these things there's not much more you have to learn. I mean, that's where our evidence stops. That's how far you can go. So, also be aware of, of those people, in fact, that want to be extremely positivistic in their interpretation. They want to state that everything was only one way and that things were just like uh, uh, they say and uh, they, they uh, like things had to be in one way, forcefully, or that history is just like um, uh, a, ser a series of predetermined factors that had all to 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 let's say to, to make sense uh, in uh, in absolute terms. Most of of this world is completely unknown to us, so it's useless to be dogmatic about certain topics. It's uh, but at the same time you. One, once you arrive to the limit, you can be much more rational about it because you know what you're talking about. 
So this is also a an, yet another video we make on the Seleucids and I will create therefore at this point a playlist dedicated to them in the first place. And we will keep talking about them. There is a, a whole lot of stuff to talk about uh, relatively to the Seleucids. And for now, however, we stop it here. I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.